Okay, I think it's better to let's start and have a presentation now, and then we can have a break. Yeah, so we can give. I think so too. Yes, otherwise yeah. we will running out of time in the next session. All right, um, Sapta Shinwari, I will briefly introduce you uh, as well. Um, we are moving over to the Middle Eastern part of our initial uh, idea for this session again. Um, but also you have been uh, doing your PhD uh, at the Kyoto University in Japan. So again, we see that we have a very cultural, multicultural backgrounds. Um, and Sapta also worked at the Pakistan Museum of Natural History, the National Agricultural Research Center, the WWF uh, Pakistan and Comstech before his appointment as a vice chancellor of Kohat University of Science and Technology. Um, he also established the University of Science and Technology in Banu, um, and he was then tenured professor of biotechnology and dean of the Faculty of Biological Sciences at Kaid e Assam University, Islamabad, and president of the National Council of TIP. Um, he is also a fellow of the World Academy of Sciences and the Pakistan Academy of Sciences and vice president of the Islamic World Academy of Sciences. So you have many different affiliations. Um, he was also um, awarded uh, the prestigious title of Distinguished Scientist uh, from the Chinese Academy of Sciences in 2019-2020 and uh, listed among the top 2% uh, in the world whose published research manuscripts have accelerated progress in their respective fields in the past three years even. Uh, and finally, uh, one important thing to mention as well, uh, I think, is that um, he also um, achieved in extending higher education facilities to the neglected communities of Pakistan, especially to females. I think that is an important issue uh, to raise here as well. So the floor is yours. I'm looking forward to your presentation now. Thank you. And can I share my screen? Uh, because I try to share if possible. Uh, it should be possible for all um, workshop participants. Um, yeah, perfect. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much, first of all. Uh, I'm really grateful to the Astron Academy and the project of President uh, for, for inviting me. And uh, it's really very close to my heart when we talk about ethics. So uh, thank you. And uh, I try to, uh, yeah. Uh, so let me quote uh, recent uh, Twitter of uh, Wen Chen Bao, who says, we have to make sure that artificial intelligence or for that matter, you can take it digital ethics is developed for us, not against us and to harness uh, the its uh, value for social good, it must be ethical and human-centered. Uh, with that, uh, we live in two different worlds to be very candid. One is where you guys live, the West, you, we call it, and we are in the East, uh, the, the education literacy rate, those who can read and write in my region where I live, uh, close to Afghanistan and India and uh, uh, where on, uh, not even 50% people can read and write. And there, but they all have mobile, they are cheated sometimes. Uh, they are, the words that we call it privacy, etc., are sometimes uh, uh, not known to them. So, uh, of course, first we appreciate the development that we had in the last, I will call it uh, three, four decades. Uh, email, virtual. Today we are sitting in two different continents and we are talking to each other, in social network, etc. Uh, but then, uh, and that has enabled us uh, about the decisions and farm decisions, about the connectivity that we are connected. Uh, that is what we are transformed from the last century into this century. Uh, but this process, uh, of course, then uh, uh, we should be knowing its priorities. Uh, its impact and its user experiences. Uh, 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 of course, as I said, it may be different for you uh, and may be different for us, the part that where I live. So uh, when we talk about 
digital uh, transformation innovation, we should remember that ethics should be part of it. And if you talk about its development, the recent article I'm quoting from the last week article from Nature, where uh, the digital bridge, what they call it, helps a paralyzed man to walk. So of course, there's a lot of opportunity for the human being to use it for good. Uh, but uh, at the same time, of course, we have to consider the ethics that, that should be there. For example, uh, its impact on individual society and environment. And when we talk about these three elements, individual society and environment, we should be uh, knowing the ethics regarding data privacy, algorithmic bi biases, uh, and the use of artificial intelligence there, uh, where we have to be really thinking about all this. So uh, when, we, when we are talking about the digital transformation, it's challenges. Uh, specifically in my part of our, well, well, I'm talking about the low and middle income countries. Uh, that is that we don't have a very good management strategy. We don't have enough expertise available to get uh, benefits from it. And we are worried that we, we, we may be used as a guinea pig sometime by the others, uh, like our data privacy is no more there. Uh, we, 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 our, if you talk about even non-experts, they think that they are exposed to anybody anywhere in the world. Uh, they have no privacy. And uh, the evolution in the customer's need, of course, uh, uh, look at me, I, on average, I receive a telephone call or a message every week that, oh, my credit card is blocked. And if I call, they will retrieve, et cetera, et cetera, just to cheat me. So that is, and I have, we have no regulations where we could complain and we could get, you know, uh, uh, caught that man or that person or that individual who is cheating us. So, uh, and then the other side, uh, there is a resistance to change. There are security concern. There are budget concern because we, we don't have enough resources to feed our people. Uh, leave aside the other uh, security issue that we can be doing. So therefore, when we talk about the digital ethics specifically in the lower and middle income countries, uh, there are two important concepts. One is the interconnectivity in today's world. Innovation particularly in this world is rapidly changing and um, it, it, uh, the, the, we should be uh, with that change that we, we believe that innovation should be used ethically. And uh, when we call about digital ethics, what are they? Moral principles and guidelines that, uh, you know, govern the use of digital technologies, uh, specifically in our part of the region. Uh, so uh, the this presentation, I, I will try to talk about a little bit about the cultural dimensions that shape the digital ethics in uh, my part of the region. So if, when I talk about cultural dimension, few of them only because of the time limit. Number one, our region and the developed world, what we call it the difference between the two, collectivism and individualism. In our part of the world, we are collectivistic society. We, we believe in the, you know, the communities, uh, interest is take precedence on the individual rights. I am my family and my family is me in that kind of a culture. So while in the other part of the world, probably individualism, individual rights are more, you know, talk about. So uh, in our part, cultural emphasis, collective responsibility, social cohesion, and respect to communal value, that is what we, 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 we this is our one. And the number two is uh, when we talk about cultural dimensions, that is the power distance. Low and middle income countries often have high power distance where hierarchies and authorities are valued. Uh, so there is that you have to say, yes, sir. And that is the digital ethics uh, should address then power imbalances between the rich and the poor and between the boss and the employee, mentor and mentee, etc. Uh, so uh, how to ensure equitable access to the technology and the resources. And the last one is that how transparency, accountability, and inclusiveness uh, can be ensured through all this. Number three, long-term orientation. Uh, you know, 
some of our countries, though they have value tradition, preserving heritage and maintaining social stability, uh, but the digital ethics should respect cultural heritage, protect indigenous knowledge. You know, our medicinal plant, we are very rich uh, biodiversity zone, for example, Himalaya, Hindu Kush, Karakuram are the biggest mountain region of the world. We are more than 20,000, for example, medicinal plants. I started my career with that plants, uh, those plants. And we take knowledge from the indigenous people, we use it, we earn billion of dollars, but never come back to the community to develop them and to give them some benefit of their resources and of their knowledge. So there is, these are the concern that we really uh, are worried about. And then now the fourth one is uncertainty avoidance. Uh, again, in this part of the world, high uncertainty avoidance tend to have a preference for rules, guidelines, and established norms. And that is that digital ethics should provide clear guidelines and frame frameworks for responsible behavior. And then uh, the ethical digital practices through education, awareness, and capacity building can reduce, uh, you know, and help uncertainty. And I will rec be recommending to the uh, through your academy and to the developed world, if they could have some resources and try to have some kind of awareness projects in these areas where we can talk about all this. And then a very important one, masculinity and uh, versus femini uh, femininity, you know, the, the gender biasness. Uh, of course, in this part of the world, uh, uh, cultural traits may prioritize collaboration, empathy, and closeness in digital practices. Feminine culture, what I'm talking about. Uh, and masculine traits may emphasize competitiveness, individualism, and innovation. So there is a difference, you know, uh, the male is considered normally as the head of a family and his orders are ordered. So there is that we can really, then we, we, we talk about the uh, digital ethics and innovations, of course, this is the most important thing that we, we need somehow to address it. And uh, they are very crucial uh, for us to, to you know, uh, take decisions. For example, in my country, men take decisions and women take uh, make dinner. This is a famous quote uh, that we uh, use. So if we talk about good digital future, uh, how could we really the problems that I have highlighted, we can address all these problems. One is uh, inclusive access, that we somehow, uh, if we could bridge the digital divide between uh, within and between the countries, uh, you know, if we could somehow help them uh, to come up, uh, hand holding, what we call it, and we ensure that no one is left behind. And this coronavirus has proved that that if we leave some communities, some part of the world population behind, uh, we can never be safe unless everybody is safe. Then cultural preservation. We should understand uh, the cultural diversity, uh, preserving local traditions, languages, and knowledge. That is very important. If we take it, we steal it somehow, we use it, uh, and we they don't benefit. So that's, uh, again, an issue. Empowerment and participation is very important. Then ethical digital practices. I'm now going quick because of time. I'm keep. I'm trying to keep time. Uh, so that is where we could uh, somehow, if we could empower our female, our uh, you know feminine, uh, what I call it, those gender biasnesses, we could reduce it. And participation of the you know marginalized communities. Uh, then we socioeconomic development, as I said, they cannot eat even two meals a day. So leave aside the other things that we are, and then collaborative partnership. I recommend our academies, your academy, my academy, I'm part of, uh, you know, at least three academies, if you could work together and we could do something for the benefit of humankind. Uh, and now, uh, one more option, how can lay people think outside the expert? community large speaker also mentioned this uh, one is that the lay people of course they have limited awareness they have privacy concerns as i said they believe that uh, people breached uh, the ethics while data breaches surveillance unauthorized sharing of personal data to the banks to the uh, you know uh, companies 
uh, and that generates skepticism and apprehensions. Misinformation and online harassment is too much in this part. And there are no clear rules to, to catch the culprit. Digital divide again, as I said, uh, rich and poor, digital well-being, and trust and accountability is another important. So how can we overcome all these issues? Now, I think code of conduct, uh, standards and guidelines. I give you an example. Uh, Pakistan, though, is a very you know low-income country, but we, with the well, thanks to the U.S. Academy and to the IAP and ASA and other academies, UNESCO, we had a very good you know. Uh, code of conduct standards and guidelines when it comes to bioethics, biosafety, biosecurity, dual use of education. It's a very good success story. So same can be done here. Uh, this I ju just give you an example. Last one decade we worked on it because we were worried we are in a volatile region and on the border of Afghanistan, Iran, and India. Uh, so we 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 were trying to safeguard. We have to uh, raise awareness among the youth not to misuse uh, the labs. Uh, like virologies and others. So uh, if I conclude this, uh, global innovation and digital ethics are two interconnected concepts. Uh, you cannot ignore one for the other. So if we, these are essential to create a sustainable and inclusive uh, ethical digital, digital society. And again, just in a few words, uh, the principle for digital transformation uh, design for privacy, security, integrity, promote uh, trust, be aware of biases, and ensure th that there is an accountability and promote an ethical culture. Uh, so what we should be doing in Pakistan, for example, uh, current what are the current uh, digital ethics? How can we promote this culture? How can we, uh, you know, so we in our academy, we are trying to, to discuss these issues and trying to, uh, you know, advise the government solution for this. Of course, there are challenges uh, of digital transformation journey, like work ethics, culture, lack of domain knowledge, frequent leadership changes. We, we you know, uh, we, we are not stable uh, kind of a democracy or economy, uh, delays in uh, releases of funds, no separate procurement rules and regulation, no national policy for data governance, uh, context-driven digital payments, gateways, et cetera, secure and reliable digital accesses. So that is uh, that we have to somehow uh, work and these are some of the ethic dilemma, ethical dilemmas, and uh, for example, for artificial intelligence uh, that I have mentioned, uh, uh, from automa uh, automated decision, uh, lethal autonomous weapon, the many things that can be misuse of artificial intelligence and proliferation of deep fakes, what we call it. Uh, so these are the issues that we somehow need to discuss. Um, and finally. Uh, when we talk about uh, AI specific ethical concern, uh, what are they? For example, now chat GPT, either you can use it to teach or for to cheat. So that is that you have to distinguish the uh, two extremes. So truthfulness and accuracy, copyright ambiguities, misuse of all this, uh, uh, you know, uh, technologies in education and marketing and social engineering, etc. And how can you, you know, navigate these dilemmas? Of course, through transparency, explainability, inclusiveness, and alignment. So that is what uh, uh, we can do. And uh, government is trying to take some initiative, though their priority is economy and they have a lot of problem. But we are aware of the future trends and opportunities. And uh, uh, we are working now in the academy to at least have some of the important issues that we need to address. Uh, but the most annoying cultural stereotype, uh, what we call it, is that in our uh, part of the world, technology backwardness, a resistance to digital transformation. This is one, or simplification of all this. This is, you know, we say, oh, it's a, uh, we don't give it more importance. And we ignore the diversity of experience innovation, disregarding achievements. There are very good, some individuals, some communities, some organization, they have wonders. So we have to, you know, appreciate champions are there. And 
uh, condescending attitude, unequal power dynamics, as I said, and undermines the agency of people of uh, so. Uh, and if we if we try to summarize it, so we have to change the stereotype. We have to highlight success stories. We have to recognize local innovation and emphasize the digital inclu inclusiveness and foster cross-cultural exchanges, engage the cultural sensitivity. Uh, and that will impact the change of stereotype if we empowerment and recognition. We do collaboration and partnerships within the country and among the countries, among the academies, among the developed world. And we do this, uh, uh, you know, innovation and creativity. It will be more useful. I really am grateful to your academy that and the project that you are doing all this. This this is really a very good uh, initiative. And if I conclude, so the cultural stereotype of backwardness in the low and middle income countries not only annoying uh, and detrimental. By challenging these stereotypes, we can, you know, promote inclusiveness narrative that can foster appreciation and diverse approaches to digiti uh, digitization. And we can embarrass in cultural sensitivity and recognize local achievements that can lead to meaningful collaboration uh, to drive change. I'm really, uh, my final words would be, if we were all work together as a team, we can achieve uh, our goal. And thanks to the, your project, um, uh, the Global Innovation and Digital Ethics, and your academy. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for this rich presentation. Um, we are a bit over time, but I would still suggest to take one or two questions or comments, and then we go into the break. Are there any questions? You can also raise your hand with the emoji. Oh, there is one. Chik Chan Chin, please. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, my question is actually, um, uh, I I I found there's a very interesting contradictory uh, concept among the what you just mentioned about diversity of culture and local experience, but at the same time we know there's an intense debate in terms of fragmentation. Did you hear about that? In terms of fragmentation of governance, in terms of fragmentation of the assets. Or, or use experience, you know, infrastructures and uh, governance as well. So I, I want to know how do you reconcile these two concepts? Why is it emphasized on the, we have to address the, the fragmentation, but you are also celebrate the concept of diversity. Thank you. If I could understand correctly your question, what you asked uh, is that how can we take benefit of the diversity that we have uh, in the communities, how the governance structure uh, uh, can be used in a good way to, to not only uh, inclusiveness, but appreciate the diversity. Uh, oh, yeah. in, 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 in my part of the world, like we, we are a uh, country of uh, uh, some now close to 240 million people. And um, uh, there are around uh, you know, 50 different languages that we speak, and they are as different as uh, English versus any other language, uh, Spanish, etc. Uh, it's totally different people, totally di because of, you know, um, uh, it's a historical background. You are right. Uh, uh, what we are, you know, asking the government that if we could, you know, uh, somehow dilute the powers and give some, some you know, uh, decision making uh, powers to the local communities, indigenous people, and those who are, uh, you know, uh, deprived of the facilities, maybe uh, they can take decision by themselves. Unfortunately, uh, I will call it 5% are ruling 95%. Uh, these 5% people, elite people, they take decision for the rest of the 95% people. So that is the, that we have problem. Uh, but if we, this, this fragmentation and this division if you could try to have some local kind of arrangement, local uh, governance systems, I think that can help. I'm sorry if I could understand what you wanted to me to explain it a little more. Yeah, um, yeah, I think you answer part of the questions. It's just more about you know um, how to put it because uh, we we will try to say that something which is fragmented, divided the uh, governance system around the world because of the 
Chinese system or the Pakistan system, Asia system, and European system, you know. So that's what we call the, uh, we, we say that it's a fragmentation. So we want to uh, achieve something which is unified, uh, common ground. But at the same time, so how can we also embrace and celebrate the diversity? So so that's a way we have to, because there's, there's an intensive debate about the fragmentation of the governance principle, like uh, we talk about harmony, uh, human rights, you know, and we also talk about stability and the difference. So, so but then we need to also embrace, that's a diversity. Yeah, uh, very good. Now I got it. You know, usually when I speak, I say sometimes believe whether we are all homo sapien or not. Uh, if we are, if we are the same species, so then we are sort of uh, brothers and sisters, you call it, or whatever you gave it, but we are the same. Unfortunately, you are right. If we, this diversity, this fragmentation, uh, and uh, secondly, again, I, my wish, my wish is that if the world leaders someday say, I'm doing this thing for the human, uh, you know, benefit or for the hu for the human uh, things. We never say that. We usually hear, "I'm doing this in our national interest." So that is, you are right. If we all have some kind of a, uh, you know, saying that we are all one, let's try, let's appreciate the diversity, this fragmentation, this division, this you, know, this is a beauty. This is like flowers in one bouquet. So we, if we have a positive mindset. Uh, unfortunately, this world, as you said, it's not in my hand and your hand, um, but uh, the, the, the politicians, they have made it so complicated uh, uh, that uh, sometimes it's very difficult. Uh, they, we have a missed out and missed things on everything. And nobody tries to really bridge all this. Uh, what I believe is that Chinese system, excellent for them. We should appreciate it. Diversity, Pakistan, Europe, America, this all, they should, uh, individual rights, community rights, etc. as I said. Let's appreciate that. Uh, but unfortunately, we, we come into other domain and we try to influence or we try to, uh, you know, say I am right and you are wrong. There is where we make mistakes. So if we say if you are right in your own sphere and let's share, I think we can find some solution. I see Alejandro raising his hand and I'm not sure, Max Haller, did you also wanna say something? Or yes, you... I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, of course, loud and I'm clear. sorry, I don't see the screen now. I have some problems, but I can ask a question. Perfect, go ahead. Okay, so thank you, Mr. Shinvari. I think your lecture was very interesting for me. And you pointed to a very important topic. You said in many low and medium income countries, collectivist cultures, communities' interests are more, take precedence over individual rights. I think this is a general topic we have to discuss in this regard. I would say, give two examples the family, where we can see the interests of individuals and of the family. I think the interests of women in a family are to control the number of children, to control fertility. But the interests of men or the family or the society might be to have to, as many children as possible. Another example is the state, relation state individual. A state often acts in military means. He invades another country or defends against another country. From the individual point of view, many citizens, including Women who have husbands who go to war or children would be against that war. So I doubt a little bit if we can say the community has precedence over individual interests. We can say also in Western societies, communities are very important. The family, social groups, the nation state are very important also in Europe and in America. So another view could be in any situation, there is, might be a conflict between individual interest and community interest. And both have to be regarded to the same degree. But it's not possible to say that the interest of community or the interest of individual have precedence. I would like to ask you, Mr. Shinbar, what you think about this view. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max. Hello. Thanks for encouragement. Uh, you are right in, 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 a, in a way, but let me explain it a little bit to you. Uh, for example, initially I was working on bioethics. Now, if I go to a my community person goes to a doctor and doctor says you have two options. 
One is to operate, the other one is to take medicine, it will take long alone. So which one you like? The patient will say, come on, why are you asking me? I'm not the doctor. It's your decision, take it. Like they don't understand and they believe that the doctor is, uh, you know, so the, when we say the informed consent, for example, now in this case, when we say community versus individual, uh, for example, population growth, and maybe in Europe, uh, people, uh, the, the community would love to have more children because of uh, in Japan too, the population is, you know, uh, reducing. In my country, we are, another, uh, we are increasing too much. We were, uh, you know, 50 years back, uh, 60 million. Now we are 140 million. No, sorry, 240 million. Uh, so uh, that is, uh, and now the community should think the biggest problem for us is the population growth because we somehow we have less resources, etc. So the rights now of individual, if they go, like Chinese government earlier said, they will have one children per family. And now they are coming to the community, they need more population. So there are sometimes conflict between individual decision and the what the community needs or what the country needs to have a policy, for example. If my country says you will have only one children or two children, that government cannot survive a single day because they will say, you know, you can't take such a decision. Uh, they, I gave you a funny story. The other day there was on a social media, the, the beggars, one beggar family had some 19 children or something, the husband and wife. They're very young, 40 years of age, maybe. And the, the anchor was saying, why are you are having? He said, oh, we have fun. We have a fun. They, 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 so that's the question that when we say community rights versus individual rights, though that, and then the government cannot produce, you know, in your country, there is a social system, excellent social system that for children, free education, meal, et cetera, et cetera. In my country, oh, nothing. In fact, they have to pay for it. So uh, even if I said, if the government says, come on, we, the government cannot afford even to pay the money for the school tuition for a small child, they cannot go to school. 50% uh, of population cannot go to school. So there are a lot of things that individuals and <coughs> community have differs in it. And somehow, uh, you know, we have to, uh, to uh, like you said, in, uh, in, my, uh, in our houses, if I go to the kitchen and my wife is there, they say, oh, come on, what's wrong with you? Why you are going to kitchen? Uh, are, you, are you angry with me? So these, these are, you know, uh, uh, things that are in culture for the hundreds of years. Alejandro? Okay, thank you, Mr. Shinvari. That was also very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, uh, Professor uh, Shinvari, I, I also come from the natural sciences. I actually made my position is in the School of Chemistry of the National University of Mexico. So I resonate with uh, a lot of your previous work. And I wanted to, to ask you one thing about the stereotypes that I think that may uh, create an environment for our digital ethics discussion, which is, uh, do you see a spillover from, or, or, or what are the main uh, prejudices and stereotypes that are affecting negatively? Uh, parts of your work, particularly on genetically modified organisms. And does that spill over, let's say, as an anti-science attitude uh, towards all the digital ethics? And just a data point, our country has established a law that forbids planting transgenics. Uh, we're only planting those that were already allowed, and we are forbidding uh, corn or maize, which is, of course, uh, Mexico is a native country. So there's a very intense discussion about this. We feel very strongly uh, and I, I, I would like to know how, how you see this. A very good question, because I'm going next uh, month to Montreal with CBD. We are discussing synthetic biology uh, and its impact on the, I'm on that committee, uh, on the biodiversity. And then now, again, GM food, or bio, uh, synthetic biology, the modern technology, again, AI is part of it. Uh, when we talk about genes, my labs is basically working on all this. Um, uh, then the rules regulation, uh, how it implies on the, you know, communities. Uh, you are aware that we have two uh, basic principles. One is precautionary approach, European approach. The other one is American approach. Don't worry, we have done enough, use it. 
<coughs> my country, unfortunately, is in between. In between, we don't have clear-cut rules. We, we have rules, but some, the elite sometimes don't uh, follow the rules.